Good evening, everybody. Welcome, and welcome back to the Breyer Center for Overseas Studies in Florence. My name is Linda Campani. I'm the director of the program. And I have the distinct honor and the pleasure to introduce Dr. Lorenzo Vinismaghi, who is an Italian economist, currently chairman of SNAM, an Italian listed company which is operated, operating in the regulated gas sector. He serves as non-executive director of Morgan Stanley International. He's a visiting scholar at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and is also senior research fellow at the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Rome. He is also the president of the Fondazione Palazzo Strozzi. Those of us who live here in Florence know how that Fondazione has changed uh, really the face of the city and the art in the city dramatically. Palazzo Strozzi, for those of you who might not know it, is a mixed uh, private public institution that promotes cultural initiatives here in Florence. Coming up on March the 14th, Palazzo Strozzi will host the exhibit called Power and Pathos, Bronze Sculpture of the Hellenistic World. The exhibition uses 50 bronze sculptures to tell the story of artistic developments of the Hellenistic era throughout the Mediterranean. It will run through June the 21st. Dr. Vinismaghi was a member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank from June 2005 to November 2011. He was responsible for the bank's international and European relations. He ran the legal department of the bank and its administration, and in addition, he has served as the Euro European Central Bank's Deputy Director General for Research. Prior to his time for the Euro at the European Central Bank, Dr. Dr. Vinismaghi was Director General for International Relations at the Italian Ministry of Economy and Finance. He was head of the policy division of the European Monetary Institute in Frankfurt. He was also the head of the Exchange Rate and International Trade Division of the Research Department of the Banca d'Italia in Rome. He has published extensively in monetary policy and international economics. Dr. Vinismaghi graduated from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium with a degree in economics. He has a master's in economics from the University of Southern California, uh, uh, which he earned with a scholarship from the U.S. Italy Fulbright uh, Commission. He also holds a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vinismaghi, for the accepted our invitation to come speak at Stanford University. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can all see. Maybe I can speak also. You can speak on, yeah. yeah. Yes. You can see also the presentation I have prepared for you. First, thanks for the invitation. I've been to Stanford, uh, U.S. twice. Uh, one was, uh, the last time was, I think, about 14, 15 months ago at the business school, uh, invited by uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, at the Federal Reserve, Kevin Walsh, who is uh, teaching there. And, and then, uh, more than 30 years ago, I went to see a football game between USC and, uh, <laughs> and the Cardinals, right? Yes. Um, which I think USC won. Uh, uh, in those days, uh, USC was very strong and, and, and Stanford was not. Um, so it's really a pleasure. I apologize for being late. Actually, I was discussing with the new director how, how we had, because we changed director in the in Palazzo Strozzi, so there is a transition, and uh, so I've been busy doing that. So I, I thought um, you know, today to, to have a discussion with you, um, being in a university, American university in Europe, um, one of the interesting issues is always to compare uh, the economic performance in, uh, in Europe and in the US. Uh, why is it different? We saw the last... Uh, number of uh, 2014 plus quarter plus uh, five uh, more than five percent growth rate on a trend euro area is uh, close to zero now it seems to be picking up but the gap is really huge so the question we always ask ourselves uh, why did the u.s get out from this crisis or are, are getting out of this crisis better than the europeans even though the crisis started in the U.S. 
And uh, I think that's, that's an interesting issue to start discussions about the economic. I think, what do we have, like 40 minutes and then we have a discussion maybe? Yes. So I thought I, I would uh, bring you a few, few slides uh, to, uh, to look at the, at the two areas. Um, let me see if I can make it work. So, I'm trying. Otherwise the manual is better. No, it should work. It worked before. <laughs> there you go. Ah, so oh, yeah. left and right. Okay. Okay. So this is the the first typical chart that you would uh, have in any starting presentation. Uh, we see the GDP starting in 2007, so before the crisis, then during the crisis and after the crisis. And then you see that, interestingly, until 2011, more or less, the pattern is quite similar. See, the blue is the Eurozone and the red is the US. And then, in 2011, something changed. The, US, the Euro area basically went back into a kind of a recession and the US continued to grow. And if you look at the, another picture, which is even more telling, which is GDP per capita, which in my view is more useful because you, you take away the differential in population growth between the US and Europe, which is uh, an element uh, which is quite characteristic of the, of the US. Uh, so taking away population growth and you look at GDP per capita, you see that uh, actually uh, a similar, even, even more telling, that until 2011, 2012, the recovery was there in, the, in, in Europe. Europe went through the crisis uh, more or less like the US, but then in 2011, something happened. So what, what happened here? Why um, we have this differential pattern? And the typical uh, discussion that you have in newspapers, in academic world, when you start discussing US and Europe, the main um, discussion is about fiscal policy, about austerity. Europe went to austerity and the US went instead to expansionary fiscal policy. And this explains why the US you know, put more money into the economy, got the economy growing back uh, in 2010, 2011 and continued, while the Euro area instead a private austerity, went through crisis, in the end this austerity did not work. And if you want to test this, of course you can go through a lot of research and, uh, and, and many things, but what I would like to uh, put to you to, today is, is really the things are a bit more complicated than that. Um, and if you look at some of the numbers, uh, it suggests that, you know, in the end, fiscal policy has not been that different between the US and the Euro area. So this is the general government uh, balances. So uh, underlying balances, structural balance means if you take away the cycle, when the economy uh, grows, typically the budget improves because we have more tax uh, receipts. And when the uh, economy slows down, you have less tax receipts, you have more unemployment compensation. So you, don't, you can't really tell the stance of fiscal policy uh, if you do not take away these endogenous elements. So this is what this measure is doing. You are taking away from the budget all these endogenous to see what is the stance, the fiscal stance. And what you see is that in 2008, 2009, indeed the US has provided a strong stimulus uh, in terms of change, in terms of e expansion of the budget, the, the negative means expansionary, more deficit. So it increased the deficit in these two years. Uh, in Europe, it did uh, uh, increase the deficit, structural deficit increased, but not as much. So you could say that you know in the first two three years, actually until 2010. When you go to 2010, uh, fiscal policy became restrictive also in the U.S. and actually even more if you take 2013. Um, why is then the rhetoric so different? Why do we say that we have more austerity in Europe? Uh, one thing that uh, those who look at the US data often forget is that they look at the central government. 
Now, what's something that happened in the US that is uh, rarely known, unless you, you are a public official, is that while the central government has had a relatively expansionary policy, maybe to some extent also in 2010, the local government, so the, the states, municipalities, had a very restrictive policy, uh, had to fire people, had to cut down on, on expenditure. So if you took at the aggregate uh, general government, which is a concept uh, you know, of the overall state, even the local, then the US had a restrictive uh, fiscal policy. <coughs> now, of course, I will explain you later, this average of the euro area uh, hides a lot of differences within Europe, and we'll come back to that. But just looking by to this aggregate picture, suggests that there may be something more that has been happening to explain uh, let me see again to explain this uh, this difference here that because this divergent path which starts in 2011 2012 really is not is not explained by by on the contrary here you look at fiscal policy in the US this was at the time of the let's say the budget limit I was what is called the uh, uh, I forgot, uh, when there was a risk for the government to, to not to be able to default. pay the default. Yeah. So it was very restrictive in 2013. So something else must have happened. And this is where I would like to, uh, you know, to, 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 to guide you through some uh, analysis. Now something that happened is in 2000, let me get you step by step. What we have is not a unified Eurozone. It's a Eurozone with, uh, now we have 19 states, 19 governments, so we don't have a single fiscal policy. And the fiscal policy which is implemented by each government depends a lot on the sustainability of the public finances in each of these countries. And what we have in 2010 is the first Greek crisis. So five years ago, Spring 2010, the first big crisis. This is, is here. It's not, you see, it's not a lot of noise. You know, there was a risk of default, but then something else happened later, in 2010 and 2011. And what happened? Two very important issues. In 2011, yeah, sorry, at the end of 2010, the uh, European governments, in particular the, the then uh, still Chancellor uh, Merkel and President Sarkozy, in the discussion of uh, how to create this, uh, what is called the ESM, so the European uh, Stability Mechanism, which would provide funds to countries that have problems, uh, this uh, fund that was being discussed uh, so which, which basically entails that taxpayers of other countries have to help bail out taxpayers of, of, uh, of countries which have problems, this fund should intervene. When it intervenes, when it provides its fund, so when we use taxpayers' money, we should also involve other creditors, the banks, for instance. Why? So the reasoning, which was relatively, uh, if you think about it, relatively sound, why should we taxpayers help out bail out another country while a lot of creditors like banks who are lending and who are just no, not putting any money in? So the idea of this private sector involvement uh, basically said that whenever a country would apply for other countries' help, it would also have to have a haircut towards its uh, private creditors. And what happens, and why this, is, this, this chart is a spread, the risk, uh, a measure of risk. What happens? Well, all the banks, all the creditors, all the pension funds started asking themselves, you know, which countries uh, may risk defaulting and so lead to a haircut uh, in our own portfolios. And of course, Greece was, was a candidate, you have this, the, the blue, blue line, but also then all the others, the uh, 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 Spanish, we here have Spanish and Italian. 
So the spread between Spain and, and Germany, Italy and Germany, and Greece and Germany. So you see the contagion in the euro area, which is uh, something which is very difficult to, to forecast. And we may come back to today and the Greece crisis, the Greek crisis. Is contagion the same? Contagion basically means that you know, financial uh, companies, uh, banks, when they see it, some event, they ask themselves, is this event going to happen again and who is going to be affected? And so when, when the discussion about this new ESM started uh, to, be, to be held among the countries, and when the fear is that whenever you receive assistance from the ESM, you also have to have a haircut in private creditors, the risk on these countries went up. And then it went even up, up, and up uh, when the Greek default happened, actually. Because the markets asked themselves, well, okay, Greece defaulted or restructured, so all those who had a Greek bond only got 50% of what they had. Uh, who else is going to do the same? Is Italy going to do the same? Is Spain? And so the risk went up. And it took a lot of action. We may want to go back uh, to discuss that. It took a lot of, of action to bring back stability. And the interesting thing that, again, as I said, we will discuss later, is that recently we have a new Greek crisis, but the government bonds of the other countries are continuing to fall. Actually, they are below one now. So contagion is lower now than it was uh, in 2010. Why? Well, um, the first, so the first theory of why Europe is different than, than the US is that uh, the crisis happened at a time when uh, Europe was not complete, did not have many instruments uh, that the US instead had, and we will come back to that. Uh, so had to create the instruments um, to address crisis, because when the euro was created, the assumption was that crisis would not happen. And this is not something strange. I mean, if you look at the US history, it's the same. You never think about possible uh, crisis, and when they happen, you have to change your institutional setup. And it's very difficult to do that. Um, and I can give you an example also of the, of the US. So during the crisis, and during 2000, basically as we see here, 11 and, and 12 in particular, this crisis in the financial markets led to the creation of the ESM, so the European Stability Mechanism, the Banking Union, the European Central Bank who had to intervene and say that it will protect the euro from any exit, and so on and so forth. So all these things have brought the markets to be very close to what they were before the crisis, but it took a lot of steps. It took five years, and it's not over because we don't know yet whether the, the euro area is going to be still of 19 countries or, or less. So the exit is not excluded, which is instead excluded in the, in the, in the US, de facto. So, the ins one answer, if you want, is institutional setup. So, part of the difference in the crisis, in the, in the dynamics of growth, is due to the fact that Europe had to build up uh, some of its institutions uh, during, uh, during the crisis. And the one, so this is another chart which I will not illustrate, it's the correlation, again, between uh, uh, between uh, uh, risk. But this is another interesting chart to explain why institutions are important. So what happened during the crisis to banks, to the behavior of banks, to bank credit in particular, how banks lend to the private sector? What you observed in the US read, collapse the crisis, then something happened and boom, again. So this is a normal crisis. Something happened, I will explain what. In the euro area instead, it went down and it stayed down. Mm -hmm. So what happened here? Well, uh, I don't know how many of you read this book, uh, Too Big to Fail, mm -hmm. or other movies, and, and there have been a lot. What happened here is that the US was on the verge of collapse of the financial system. And uh, at that point, it was uh, right after Lehman Brothers. The uh, then Secretary Bolson uh, prepared a package of public money 
to put in to stabilize the banking system. It didn't have a clearly what ideas, I mean, not a clear idea of what exactly to do, but to put public money to stabilize the system. Then it went to the Congress, and Congress voted against. To say that, you know, it's not easy even in the US. Then, uh, again, I, I, I advise you to read this book, and there are other books, The Memories of Tim Geithner. Then Paulson, then the stock market collapsed even more. Paulson went and you know, bent his knees in front of Nancy Pelosi and said, you have to vote, otherwise the US is over. And then they voted, so it was 700 billion, I think, the, uh, this package uh, to uh, bail out the financial system. Now, to explain how difficult politically it was, in particular for the majority at the time who was Republican, I think most of the senators and representatives from the Republican Party lost their seats. And that was the start of the uh, uh, anti-Wall Street uh, on, the, on the left and the other side of the Tea Party and the very strong campaign against those Republicans who had voted. Because this was to use public money to bail out the banks. Now, what happened with this money? There was a lot of discussion. In the end, what happened is that the Treasury, US Treasury, the Federal Reserve put closed in a room the uh, CEOs of the uh, 12, I think, major banks and said, now we're going to put public money into your banks. You have to sign for it. Uh, this will allow you to remain uh, sound, solvent. It will allow you to continue to lend. You don't have to restrict credit. So it will avoid the collapse of the so the so-called credit crunch. And it's inter interesting because the book and there was a movie. I mean, the, the bankers, of course, don't like. Uh, uh, somebody apparently said this is socialism. This is against the spirit of uh, the United States. Uh, and Paulson said that uh, this is in the interest of the United States. You have to take it. And in fact, uh, the money exposed what happened. That the banks took the money. Uh, avoided a credit crunch. After a while, the assessment was made about the solvability of these banks, the stress test, and the banks in the end gave back the money to the government, to the state, and actually taxpayers made money in the US, which is not often uh, at all. So this is one of the case, these cases where uh, you need a public intervention, and if it is right in stabilizing the, the system, the government or the states, then the taxpayers, get back the money and the system remains stable. So it was very efficient. What happened in Europe? So in Europe it didn't work out because we didn't have a, a state, we didn't have a fund to decide together. Public finances were much more fragile in some countries, in Ireland for instance, even in Italy. Politically not all countries could do the same. In Germany, they were able to put some money in and stabilize, but in other countries, the government was more fragile, and if you want, you can think about what happened to Monte dei Paschi in Italy, uh, where basically the government did not dare to put money, said, I will lend money at a very high interest rate, which was not in the interest of the banks, by the way. And in the end, it, was, it had to be transformed into a participation. Um, and then the supervisors, in the US you had one supervisor, in Europe you had many supervisors, and each country supervisor had the incentive to say, well, my banks have no problem. And if you read newspapers in Italy and other parts of Europe, everybody was very protective. So in the end, there was no intervention. In some countries, they had to be a bailout, out, like in the case of Ireland. Uh, but basically, banks remained weak, and weak banks don't lend. And this explains why, and if you disaggregate this uh, country by country, you see that in some countries you really had a reduction, and Italy is one of them. A weak banking system doesn't land, and this affects the real economy. And you see really that the difference in the end is around 2011-2012, because before that, Europe had, uh, to some extent, with uh, with help, I mean, it was able to, to react much better than before. But it was really after 2011, 2012, in connection with the financial crisis, that uh, 
the banking system uh, was not able to, to respond as efficiently. And another, okay, this is the country by country. You can see that Spain, for instance, has there been a 10% collapse. If you look at the, this is rates of growth, 2014, 10%, and so this is not cumulative. It's really, and this is Italy, which is now is still below zero. But the other thing, which is different also, is that this is, uh, is not only banks, but is the whole capital market. And uh, one of the key differences between Europe and the US is in the US, the banking system channels a bit more than a third of the flows to the economy. The rest is the capital market, bonds, stocks. Because you have an integrated system where people throughout the US and even abroad can invest very easily, very liquid. In Europe, we don't have a really integrated capital market. Most of the flows to the real economy are intermediate banks, more than two thirds. So the banks are much more important in Europe than in the US. So when banks uh, are sick, the economy is sick, even more in Europe than in the US. And that's why now we have a discussion in Europe, those of you who, who read a little bit, a little bit about European issues, not only about banking union, which has been completed and we are starting and we're working, but the capital market union. So trying to do that in the US, to have really a system that uh, channels flows more efficiently between savers and, uh, and, and, and the real economy, that doesn't have to go necessarily through the banking system, which is subject to prices. So this is another key difference between the US and uh, in Europe, that is something that Europe doesn't have and has to be built during the crisis. Then, um, another issue, second important issue, which is also being addressed in Europe but late, uh, is monetary policy. Now, this chart shows, um, you have to look at it especially after, um, after the crisis. These are interest rates, long-term interest rates. And this is the real economy, the, the economy. So growth plus inflation. And what you see in the US eh, is that long-term rates have been brought down substantially, in particular through this uh, policy which is called quantitative easing, which means that basically the central bank intervenes in the market, the Federal Reserve, to buy bonds and uh, uh, this raises the price of the bonds and reduces the interest rate. So this pushes down interest rates to very low levels, creates a lot of liquidity. It makes the, the leveraging easier, which is if you are, have a high debt, with low interest rate, it's easier to, to reimburse the debt, to, to service the debt, and it's easier to deleverage, to reduce the whole leverage. So this is a monetary policy which has been uh, implemented in the US uh, already in 2008 and has been very successful. Um, this incidentally, so the relationship between the interest rate and the growth rate is a very topical issue if uh, those of you who have read Piketty, for instance, which is uh, this new theory of capital accumulation, he says that uh, inequalities uh, derive from uh, the relationship, exactly this relationship, interest rates and growth. But uh, he gets it the other way around. He says that inequalities and, uh, and, and dispersion in the accumulation of capital increase when interest rates are higher than growth. And here it's interesting that it's the opposite that has been happening. Precisely because when you have too much debt, you want to help those who have a debt, not the creditors. Uh, and so you want to reduce the burden on the debt by lowering interest rates. Um, Interestingly, if you look at the US, at the UK, you had a similar pattern. Interest rates are lower than growth. Here again, monetary policy has been very expansionary, very interventionary to lower the interest rate. Uh, Japan is a bit more complicated because you have a lot of volatility. But if you look at the euro area, it's the opposite. Interest rates are systematically above rate of growth of the economy. What does this mean? That for those who have a debt, it's much more complicated to reimburse it. 
So this policy, to some extent, is in favor of creditors instead of in favor of debtors. It doesn't help the deleveraging. And uh, if you go and look then within the Eurozone, you look that for Spain it's dramatic, uh, for Portugal also, for Italy also, interest rate is higher than growth. Huh? Even for France, it's, uh, it's higher. There is only one exception, and I'm sure you guessed, huh? is Germany. Germany has very low interest rates. And you wonder why. Incidentally, they are the creditors, they're not the debtors, so they don't like this policy. <laughs> they would like to be in reverse. But why is that? And that's the big issue that we are discussing these days, this policy of quantitative easing. Europe has not embarked on this policy of quantitative easing because, here I think it's interesting uh, to, to discuss a little bit, what does it mean? It means that the government, I mean the, the central bank buys government bonds. So it enters into a policy which is very close to financing the government. Not directly, because it buys in the market, but it's very close. So, you know, you have to do it when inflation is low, when, because you need to help to deleverage it. But one issue is, what do you buy? You buy government bonds. But what if there is a loss? Who bears the loss? Now, in the US, if there is a loss, if the country defaults, the loss goes into the Federal Reserve, and who is the shareholder of the Federal Reserve? Is the U.S. citizens, basically. So, you know, there is a loss from one which is compensated from the other. The same is in the U.K., the same in Japan. These are three countries that started quantitative easing a few years ago. And in Europe, we will start next Monday, but it has taken a long time, because one key issue is who bears the loss if Greece defaults, if Italy defaults. Well, uh, if Italy defaults, uh, the loss will be borne by Germans, Dutch, uh, French, and other citizens. And you know, so it's a redistribution of, of wealth through monetary policy. And this creates a big debate because we don't have a political union in, in Europe yet. Eh? And so monetary policy would be led, exposed to a redistribution. On top of that, whenever you implement a policy like this of very low interest rates, you don't give really a good signal to the politicians. Uh, the president of the ECB, Draghi, often says this, that the risk of creating the wrong incentive with very low interest rates, politicians may you know, tend to delay action. It's what we call moral hazard. Not only in Europe, by the way. In, in the US, it's very similar. With very low interest rates, there was little incentive to, to really uh, uh, reduce uh, the deficit in the UK is the same. So the relationship between a central bank and politicians is always a bit difficult because when the central bank gives a lot of liquidity, well, the uh, politicians are happy because the job is done by the central bank. So as long as inflation doesn't go up above the target, it's very nice to have the central bank doing its, uh, its part of the job. Uh, in, the, in the German case, why are interest rates lower than growth? But basically because what we saw during the crisis is uh, flows of funds moving from the periphery, let's call it this way, towards the center, which is Germany. So they had some kind of uh, similar policies involuntarily as quantitative easing. People buying government bonds, German government bonds from outside Germany that led to very low interest rates. So, this is the, to go back to the euro area, um, on average, you see that this chart um, ends at the end of uh, 2014, and now interest rates are coming down, so we are now entering with quantitative easing five years later than the US because of a long discussion, and we can get to this, why did the ECB start to, in the end, to, to enter into this policy five years later? Is it too late? Uh, should that have been done before? As I said, the institutional framework is difficult. It was very difficult to do the quantitative easing without having had banking union, ESM, and so forth. So now we are entering into a phase in which conditions should be better in the euro area, conditions for the leverage. 
Let me go back then to the last point, which is, uh, and if you see here, this is a correlation between uh, this difference between interest rates and growth and the real growth of the economy. You see that there is a very strong correlation, uh, which suggests that if you reverse this relationship, growth should pick up again in, in Europe. Uh, and this quantitative easing that ECB is going to implement is, this is a US balance sheet, the size of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, how much liquidity they have put into the system. You see that in 2011, to until 2011 it was very close, and then the Fed continued to increase, and uh, uh, the, the ECB instead reduced the size of the balance sheet. We don't have the time to discuss this, but this, to some extent, was involuntary. Uh, in, it happened involuntarily because the way in which the ECB put liquidity into the system was very different from the US. It was basically on demand of the banks. And in a phase in which you have uh, an economy which doesn't grow, uh, which doesn't require more credits, the banks reduce their exposure. And so this is why we had to change instrument and introduce this new instrument which might be easy to start moving back up here. But this, to some extent, explains again the, the divergence in, uh, in growth. Um, let me get back to this chart for a final argument, more for Italians than... Uh, because here we look at the Eurozone and US. But the Eurozone is a bit more complicated. And what you, you see here, I think this chart is, is shocking, in my view. Because if you look at blue, Germany, Germany has done better than the US. So we all say, you know, the US, how fantastic the US is. Germany is much better than the US. And in fact, if you look at the numbers, unemployment, debt, uh, whatever, by whatever parameter, Germany has done much better than the US. Of course, it was maybe starting here, here there's a bit of conversion, but you know. France is, uh, is, uh, is lower, clearly, but 2012 is a change. But the real, I think, drama, if you look at it, is the green line. Because we are here, Italy, minus 12 <laughs> compared, and minus 18 compared to Germany. So this, is not a cyclical crisis. So the, the, the third element in the explanation of this divergence is that in Europe something structural is happening, not only cyclical, which is happening or which is, let say, getting even worse and worse, which is the loss of competitiveness of a country like Italy. Of course, the only country which has done worse is Greece, uh, but Italy is really, uh, if you look at Spain, to some extent is, is catching up a little bit over the last two years. But here there is an issue of, of competitiveness, of, of structural uh, issues which have to be dealt with. This is why the whole discussion about structural reforms, how to increase the competitiveness of, um, of, of the euro area, in particular some of their countries, not all the euro area have lost competitiveness, but some countries clearly have lost. So beyond fiscal policy, uh, Aside from monetary policy and so on and so forth, you have really some fundamental structural issues. And uh, let me conclude maybe on some of these. By the way, I like this chart because it shows how even more dramatic the situation is for Italy if you compare it to Greece. Because look at Greece. They had a boom, huh? which was totally unsustainable, by the way. They doubled. Here you have an index, but here they increased by 35% in, in, in seven years, eight years, which is a rate of growth of uh, more than 5%. So, it was, so, they, say, so they, they crashed. But if you take as a basis uh, 1999 is 100, the Greek per capita is still better off than in 1999. If you look at the Italian, it's worse off. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that this pattern here has been much more gradual, so the decline in Italy has been less abrupt, and, and 
embedded in the society to some extent. While people here are reacting <laughs> to some way to the crisis and they're getting angry, maybe you know, to the point that they forgot that this thing here is, is, has been produced by this overheating. But Italy is not very well positioned either because of these structural uh, uh, problems that I mentioned above. And uh, one of the issues, again, to, to go and understand a bit better, I don't want to be too long on Italy, but the, issue, the problems of Italy. We often say in Italy that we are very good at exports, that our export sector is, is great, is fantastic, uh, and so on, we should care more about the domestic. But this chart shows the contrary. And in fact, Italy is not so good in exports as we think, in the sense that it has been recovering, but the collapse has been huge. Eh? Mm -hmm. And the recovery brings us barely back to 2007. If you look at all the other countries, they're all above, including Spain. So there is, I, I show this chart to say that there is also in Italy a cultural problem in addressing some of the, the awareness of the problem. Uh, we tend always to think that this problem that we have in Italy is a problem of Europe that doesn't grow, is a problem of fiscal policy, room for maneuver, flexibility, and so on and so forth. In fact, it's a lot about structural issues and it's a lot about competitiveness. And uh, many people write about how competitive we are because of our balance, uh, you know, exports minus imports, that we are so good, but in fact, our balance, which has gone back to positive, is largely due to the collapse in export, in imports, because exports have not been growing that much. So in fact, the country has a problem of competitiveness, needs a lot of structural reforms, and this is a problem of Italy in particular, but the south of, of Europe in general, because if we were as competitive uh, as Germany, or more, a bit more complementary, uh, as, we, as we saw at the beginning, uh, we would not be as bad compared to the U.S. as we as we as we see. So this is a bit to to conclude uh, this first part of the in introduction to to start the discussion. Um, I wrote this book uh, one, one year ago, which was called "33 uh, False Verità sull'Europa," thirty-three false truths. I don't know if this exists in English. But to say that uh, in Italy we tend to, to blame others a bit too easily. And when we look at our own problems, um, we tend to say, well, it's a problem. Yes, we know that we have some problem, but in the end it's Europe. It's Europe policies, too rigid, too austerity, too much of uh, constraints. Well, if we look carefully into the data, there are some fundamental issues about Italy itself. Other parts of Europe are doing much better. And the fact that Italy doesn't have as much margins of maneuver, which in the end means that we cannot borrow as much as we would like, which is a problem uh, culturally because we forget that we need to reimburse this debt, is that basically we are in a high debt situation because of low growth. It's not so much a fiscal issue, it's a problem of growth. But of competitiveness, it's a problem of all these reforms that have been postponed, postponed, and postponed. And uh, it's easy to blame others, uh, and it's paradoxically easy in, in Italy to adopt fiscal measures rather than to make structural reforms. Uh, those of you who were in Italy uh, when the government Monti was in, they went to Parliament and adopted a lot of uh, austerity measures, increasing taxes, cutting spending. But the real reforms had to be postponed and postponed. And, uh, and, uh, there is a signal now that, that maybe some of these reforms are coming back, but we see how difficult it is to do what the others have done earlier, which are producing a much more competitive economy, while, while we, uh, in our system, are much more conservative, have a much harder time. But of course, for politicians, it's easier to, to blame Europe. Uh, when things go wrong, it's Europe's fault. When things go right, it's... Uh, is the national politicians, because in the end Europe is a union which is made still of national politicians, and there is a conflict of interest uh, to some extent uh, uh, for the national politician to give up powers to a higher level, 
Uh, and you tend to do that only when you're forced. And when are you forced? When you're in a crisis. And I think uh, it's the same in the US. If you look at the history of the US, um, it's very, very interesting because there are a lot of similarities to Europe. Uh, uh, after the, uh, Hamilton convinced uh, to, to mutualize the debt, uh, he also he was able to convince the president to have a, a central bank. That was a lot, there was a lot of discussion because the new states from the south the West were against having a central bank because this was power to, to Wall Street uh, against Main Street. And, uh, and so there was a lot of opposition. Each regional bank wanted to keep their own, uh, their own power. The president agreed and gave a license for 20 years. Then uh, when the 20 years expired, the, then the president at that time decided, I don't remember who it was, no? decided that he would not uh, renew the license because the chairman of the Federal was not called Federal Reserve, it was called something else, was too powerful. And there was a lot of opposition against that. So, so, so the, there was a kind of disgregation, and there was a series of uh, crises in the US, 1949, uh, I don't remember the dates, the last panic of 1907, before finally the Congress accepted the idea of having a Federal Reserve system which was created in 1914, 100 years ago. So, uh, and if you think even about the welfare state as we know it in the US, it was created uh, only after the Great Depression. I think the, the, the total of the federal government budget over GNP was uh, 1% until the crisis, until the, the Great Depression, more or less what it is today. Of course, these were different times we cannot compare, but to say that you know, it's only the Great Depression which led to create a real transfer system across states. And that's, that's the experience of Europe. You, you go through creating institutions and solving problems during crisis. But of course, crisis is not the best time to, to create institutions because you lose time, you have to address the issues, uh, people are not happy, they may even, you know, this process may even create backlash and people may want to, to exit, to, to, to take back power at the national level. So it's a very destabilizing process. Uh, but this is a process which, which, which works in Europe because we are democracies. You have to convince every country to give up something, to give up a power. Banking union, you have to give up supervision on banks, which is very political issue. And you need a crisis. I don't, I'm not sure that if we had the issue to discuss the issue today, we would find a consensus. Uh, again. But in 2012 there was really a crisis. People were thinking unless we do something the euro is over. And so the Germans, the French were willing to give up this. And we, it was somehow a miracle. And uh, you know, if you think about issues like energy union, uh, now unfortunately because we have an energy crisis, people are starting to talk about creating an internal market, uh, pipelines, uh, new things. Um, and, and uh, so that's the inherent instability in the process of European integration that we have to live through, which is you know, not ideal, certainly. But if you think about it, it's not that different, from, as I said, from the US. Of course, the US started you know, uh, a more united political system, but you had a civil war also. So we had our civil war in Europe, too. So, um, but you cannot compare uh, situations. This is to say that it's not that easy to interpret the process of integration that we are living in Europe, seen from the eyes of somebody who has had already 200 years of, and you look at the picture today of the US and I often have my, my, my American friends who say, why, why don't you do this, it's so simple, you know, but you know, if you, it took it a lot, a lot of time, a lot of crisis to do it yourself, and we have to go through our own crisis. And these years uh, that I showed, which explain the difference in performance, are also due to the fact that Europe had to build institutions during a crisis, uh, uh, and hopefully these institutions are resilient enough to help us avoid the next crisis. So maybe I stop here and we can have some Thank you. Yes, discussion. we'll open it up. Thank you very much, and we're opening it up to questions from all of you. So. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you uh, 
would want to talk for a minute about Iceland and, and whether it, uh, the lessons of Iceland uh, are, uh, are useful for the rest of Europe? Well, for, uh, funny enough, um, Iceland is not in Europe. In a sense, it's not the European Union. And there is one um, issue in the European Union, which is, uh, or at least a constraint, which is that you cannot treat residents differently from non-residents. Mm -hmm. So you cannot punish non-residents, which is a nice thing uh, to some extent, but prevents you from doing what the Iceland uh, government did, which was basically, I, I, have, I owe a lot of debt to the domestic people and to the foreign people, but I decided not to pay the foreigners. <laughs> which is nice. Then, of course, it created a lot of problems because then you shut down the financial markets will not lend you for some time. But it's a uh, you know, discriminatory issue, there was a lot of uh, judgments, a uh, lot of court cases. But uh, ultimately, you know, if you're outside the union, you can do that. Not it's not happening. It would immediately lead you to you know, breaches of treaty. I give you an example if you read the newspaper today. Actually, tomorrow, because the decision is today. It was an interesting case of the Court of Justice, European Court of Justice, against the ECB. Because the ECB said um, basically, if you want to clear Euro, which is to, to have a, a system whereby you trade securities in Euro, and you, you do the clearing, the clearing has to be in Euro area, because the central bank has to control it. And the UK government uh, went against the ECB in the European Court of Justice, saying that this was against the single market, because any services should be provided anywhere in Europe. And, 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 and they won, which is interesting. Uh, of course, in defense of London, which wants to do the clearing in US uh, securities, although London is out, it's outside the Euro. But restricting the settlement of your securities to Euro area is against the single market. So you are prevented from doing a lot of things, uh, which some people say is good because governments sometimes abuse. Of their power. Thank you. Uh, you make the point that quantitative um, um, easing is one of the reasons that the US has done so well. Hasn't been the case with uh, Europe, although you say that this is now going to be part of um, European policy. But surely the problem that you've indicated still exists, why would anybody buy Greek debt when there's still a very real possibility that they're going to default? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, um, this quantitative easing which has been agreed after a long time because of a lot of discussion and negotiation, in the end ended up with a solution which is, <coughs> which you wash, I would say that if there is a default, the, the cost of the default goes on the central bank, so it's decentralized. Now, how credible this is, is not clear, because if the central bank of one of the euro system collapses, they will need some help from the other. So, but it was a compromise, which, which took uh, quite a few months to, to implement. And, uh, and you see that it was not an uncontroversial decision. Some people voted against, and other stuff. And you needed, in the end, inflation to be negative convince the central bank to do it, while the West the started in 2008. So the fact that we are in a half-baked union, uh, you know, at least you know, in a step which is not final according to some, creates a lot of problems of implementation of other policies, including the single market policy. Because in, in, as long as uh, 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 the crisis was uh, more or less manageable, in, ECB created a lot of liquidity through the banking system, but when you are at zero interest rates at the lower bound, then the banks have no incentive to, you know, if you not create an additional incentive, mm -hmm. unless you go into negative territory, this is what we are, we now have a little bit in the euro area. If the bank keeps its own money with the central bank, it's punished by having a negative interest rate. And by the way, this is going to happen to us also, I think, sooner or later, that the bank starts charging us. Uh, by holding deposits. Ah. And this is, uh, this is already happening for large corporates because what we have right now is, 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 is a situation in which there is too much saving and not enough investment. People are scared. We are scared. 
we want to keep the money safe in the bank. And the only way to get us out and take risk by stocks, by you know, getting back the investment, again, is to, to punish us. To punish, uh, now of course the only thing that you cannot do is, is to have a negative interest rate on, on cash. That is a zero interest rate. But on deposit, yes, this is, you know, Denmark has a minus 0.75%. So the banks which hold, and that's something to translate, the problem is that in some legal uh, uh, frameworks, the negative interest rate is not foreseen. So there's a lot of discussion. I, mean, I wrote that in Canada. But it's very interesting. We are living in a, in a very interesting world. But this is, is our fault. Our fault collectively is that we are aging, we are afraid, we don't invest. We want safe uh, assets, we don't want to take risks, so we are, and we are creating deflation by this. And the only way to get out from inflation is to push us to take risk. I'm simplifying it. Wasn't it unwarranted risks that got us into the problem in the first place? Yes, of course. Uh, we took too much risk in the past, and we go from one excess to the other. And uh, I have to say that the, the, the system is pushing also to not take the risk. Because if you look at uh, the way which banks were under-regulated before, now that maybe I'm a bit of a banker too, so I, you know, I, I declare my conflict of interest. <laughs> now there is maybe too much regulation, in particular to hold a lot of liquidity. So the regulator, in order to avoid having taxpayers bailing out banks again, is asking banks to be very prudent, to be... Uh, so we, we go from one excess to the other. Uh, I think this is part of uh, capitalism and, and the way in which, you know, if, if we go on, and there are some theories about secular stagnation that we're not growing, we're not taking risk, so we need to, to enable people to take more risk, so in the end we will get to deregulation again when people will have forgotten how much this crisis has cost to the taxpayers, we'll get back to... But isn't the question about risk and productivity, and when risk is dissociated from productivity, then you have a problem. You don't have a problem if risk is associated with productivity. And as you say, productivity is the problem. But banks were taking risks which were non-productive risks. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the two things are are linked. I mean, uh, they are not independent one from the other. To, to create, to have productivity, you need investment, you need uh, credit, you need, uh, you know, and certainly there was an abuse. So, you know, in, in going up, there was a divergence, but the productivity was positive. Then there's been a huge adjustment, and now some people are saying there is not enough credit in the economy to, to stimulate productivity, to stimulate long-term investment, uh, infrastructure, and so forth, because, uh, People are, first, people are afraid, they don't want to take risk, and there is a lot of constraints on taking the risk. Um, so there is a correlation, you know, two things are indulgent. So we'll take just one final question. What if you have one. question for the Greece, um, you know, the next six months in Greece, with the new sort of... Sorry, you will ask me to come back uh, six months from now to explain why I was wrong. Exactly. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> well, I mean, Greece is a very interesting issue because um, you can look at it from many, from many angles. Uh, we had the Greek elections. Uh, many people thought, you know, the result of the Greek election will change Europe. And it, it produced exactly the opposite the result. It's very interesting. Uh, some, many people thought the creditors, the debtors, will all unite now against uh, the nasty. And then we find out that those who are more opposed to the uh, request of Greece to we discuss everything are, are many of the debtor countries like Spain, Portugal, and so on. Um, the problem, I mean, there are many problems, but one of the problems is that Greece um, has a difficulty. It's a bit like Italy, if you look at the exports of Greece, they have you know, increase very little. I mean, the structure of the Greek economy is not competitive. So in order for Greece to stay in the Euro area, they do have to do huge structural reforms. Not only in the export sector, but in the public administration. I mean, those who 
who have been to Greece uh, know that. Tax evasion, I mean, nobody pays tax in Greece, even less than in Italy. The, the rigidity of the, of the public sector, the, the judicial system is, you know, it's, it's an extreme. So you should ask yourself, why is Greece in the euro area? But now it is, and the Greeks don't want to exit. Rightly so, because they know that the day after they exit, uh, and their deposits, their money will be transformed into their wages, into drachmas, let's say. Immediately there will be a huge devaluation, inflation, and this will be a way to cut their own wealth. So between bad money and good money, people choose always good money. But the good money, in order to stay in, requires huge changes. And, and Greece society is, I think, as conservative as they can. So you, you go through these stages that, you know, first you get elected, and it was the same with the previous government. They got elected beating the opposition by saying, we will do things totally differently. Then they go to the European Union and they say, well, first we need more money, so give us the money, but we won't do anything that we promised. <laughs> and then, of course, the, the, the other guys say, well, you know, before asking for more money, at least start doing so. You have to change your, 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 your you know, your, your own uh, arguments at home and start to explain that maybe we cannot do exactly the same things. But the reforms and the changes that you do are painful, they take time, you delay, you create uncertainty. And during this uncertainty, nobody, nobody's going to invest in Greece. So my fear is that while Greece was projected to start moving up, this uncertainty now is going to, 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 to level growth and to maybe even worsen the situation. The attempt of the new government to try to change the, uh, uh, the rhetoric and start doing some of the things uh, will take time. And a few months from now, as things worsen, the window of opportunity will be lost. And they, you know, they will start losing consensus. Like you know, the, the party is split, they have a left wing of the party that is, it's a bit all over Europe is the same, and that, you know, as time goes by, will, if the results don't become evident, they, they will start, you know, voting as a government. So I have a fear that Greece will be an ever-ending story, that they will ask for more money, there will be more fight, and in the end, some more money will be given, and then another five years, and. The problem is, uh, I think, how contagious this is for the rest of you. And right now, we saw the charts. The markets are so much flooded with liquidity that is willing to buy anything for return because the alternative is a negative interest rate. That they will buy Italian treasury, Spanish treasury, and so forth. So this trend for the next few months, I think, is fine. But at some point, when this policy will, 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 will end, uh, the risk of contagion rise again. So the issue, the key issue, and that's, I think, I would like to close on this, that central bankers always, always uh, say, with monetary policy, I can only give you more time to do the adjustment. But in the end, uh, just by monetary policy, uh, oops, maybe, I want to end up with this chart. Um, can I go to the end or the la one of the last charts? Still more, 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 more. Last one. This. Um, Monetary policy is not going to bring this line back up here. Um, it, 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 it just, monetary policy is going to give time to Italy to produce a kind of low interest rates as in other countries like in the US to produce policies which can start making the green line go up, like the Spanish one. The Spanish have made a lot of reforms and you know, are on the right track. Of course, they went down. Not as much as Italy, but you know they are picking up. Italy has lost time. Not many reforms are done here; only austerity. 
So at some point, rates will increase again, contagion, maybe something will happen in China, and we will have a new crisis. If by that time Italy has not implemented reforms that strengthen and create endogenous growth, then we will be back up at the same level. So this is why I'm, you know, I'm a bit uh, cautious when I hear this enthusiasm of the last few days that Italy is back on growth and plus zero one. Uh, if you compare to the rest of Europe, there is a long way to go, a lot of effort. I, I think the Prime Minister knows that, and I think he's rightly saying that we need to do much more reforms, but this is a very conservative country. Uh, you need to fight a lot through the reforms. So I would say that, I would end that, you know, the, there is still a long way. We are, we are still, we are, it's better today than six months ago, but uh, from out of a European perspective, I think. A lot of policies are in the right direction, oil prices are low, the euro has, has depreciated, I don't know if you get your income in dollars or in euros, uh, some of you may benefit or not, but certainly it's, uh, no, it's, it's favorable for, for you, but you need to do the real thing uh, to make this country more competitive. Thank you very much. Thank you.